Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a great day. And I just want to start opening up with God. Thank you that you are here with us. I know I've already prayed, but just that you are here with us. Thank you for open our eyes, open hearts. Thank you that we have the Holy Spirit in us to lead and guide us into all truth. So I thank you that you can use me to speak through and everybody has their own you know, discerning Holy Spirit to take truth, look at the Bible, go to the word themselves and use the Holy Spirit to confirm or not. And I just thank you that we can all do that. We're going to look at scripture together to help us just set any doctrine of men aside, any just let's just be open to the word. Thank you that you help us do that, God. And we can guide us into all truth and teach us all things. And it is always truth and not lie. And we just praise you for that and thank you that you are with us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at a, a couple different stories, kind of mainly looking at the story of the boy that the disciples were not able to set free. And they asked Jesus why. He said, because of their unbelief. But there's more to that story. So there's, you know, I actually didn't look in Luke and John. We're looking at the Matthew and Mark version. I believe that is the only places they are. Um, I can check that after, but Matthew 17 is where we're going to start. Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 14, and we'll go to 21. Although many Bibles do not actually even have a verse 21. Um, the one in front of me does. Um, so I'm going to read from it, but I don't, I don't know if any of my other Bibles have a verse 21 and I have a number of them. They may though. I didn't check them all, but we are going to go to Matthew 17, starting at verse 14. And it says, when they came to the crowd, I'm reading in NASB, so New American Standard Bible. So, when they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. So, they... That's, you know, they'd already been given power. They already were setting people free. He said they couldn't. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted, perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. So he's saying, you're, you're not believing. And they've just experienced, you know, these amazing things, visions on the mountain, um, and healings and all these things. And he's saying, you know, okay, <laughs> all right, I'll do it. <laughs> and then he says in verse 18, and Jesus rebuked him so that he rebuked the demon and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? <laughs> And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, in a lot of versions, it says, because of your unbelief. So, because we know we have the faith of the son of God, we have the faith of Jesus. Um, but it's that faith is also an action. And so if there's any unbelief blocking us, actually acting that out and walking in our faith uh, in some versions like this one, this is not only version that says that too, I've checked this, most of them say unbelief, but because of, but I need mean this version for the verse 21. So because of littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. So he's saying, you know, you, you don't need much. You just have to stay and stand on it. And then verse 21 in mine, it's in parentheses and it says early versions do not contain this. And it says, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And I just want to pause there and look at so far, we know the disciples have already been setting people free. And there's, there's only this one instance where they said we couldn't do it. So we tend to focus, well, they couldn't do it. Well, 
they were growing and learning. They had this Holy Spirit upon them, not in them like we do. Um, and it was the only time. And after this, I mean, they seem to learn. It doesn't come up again. But people tend to focus on, even though he said twice, basically, that it was because of the unbelief, unbelief you had or littleness of your faith, um, the acting out of it. But people tend to focus on, oh, you, you have to pray, pray and fast. So we look at the way we think of prayer and fasting. I'm going to look at what prayer really means. But the way we think of prayer, which might be like, okay, taking time, set aside. I'm not saying that that's not. I mean, it's communion and fellowship with God. But did Jesus in this instance do this? It says, he just bring him to me. And Jesus said, it, Jesus rebuked him. The demon came out. He doesn't say, okay, then he stepped aside and he went and fasted for three days. And then he prayed. And he asked permission. That's that. That doesn't happen ever. Um, and we know for us, we have commands to go out and heal the sick, or raise the dead, even. And you know, we we have these commands. So it's not really like Jesus would or God would this be your will? Jesus was doing the will of the Father, and He always did that. So he always set them free. And then, so with the fasting part, he didn't fast. But also if we look at Matthew 9, so quite a few chapters earlier, Matthew 9, 14 to 15, it says, so Matthew 9, 14 to 15 says, then the disciples of John, so John the Baptist, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus, came to him asking why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So he's saying they did not fast while Jesus was there. So he wouldn't have told them to go do something and go set this person free if they were supposed to do something like fast that he had told them they're not to do while he's there on earth. And I mean, that wouldn't, and then call them unbelieving. If they were supposed to do something they can't do, then it wouldn't be their fault that it didn't work. Not that it's false, but, but it wouldn't be because of their unbelief. It would be because he set up an impossible task and that just doesn't, it with his nature and character. So we're going to go to the other version of this story, which is in Matthew. Wait, we're in Matthew. So it's in Mark 9, 14 to 29. So let's go to Mark 9, starting at verse 14 again. Mark 9, 14. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son possessed with a spirit, which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and it foams at the mouth and grinds its teeth, grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him when he saw him immediately. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. So as soon as the boy, which would be the demon in the boy, um, and it's not the boy doing this right but the demon in the boy saw jesus the spirit threw the boy into a convulsion and falling to the ground he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth and he asked his father so jesus asked the father how long has this been happening to him and he said from childhood it has often thrown him into both the fire and into the water to destroy him but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believe. So again, he's just saying that's, you just believe, <laughs> believe. And faith is that action that comes from that belief, right? Um, 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we have hope and, and confident expectation of good things to come. We believe what we ask for and prayer shall be done so we can ask it and be confident we believe. And anyway, so it says, if you can, like, yes, yes, I can. All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy, boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. So we can have both. We can believe and have some areas of unbelief that we're still working to renew our mind in. That's okay. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you dead, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. So that's his brain I guess I mean right he's speaking he's commanding the enemy to get out get out of this child he didn't ask he's doing the will of father because he only ever did the will of father he commanded the enemy to leave this boy so that is the will of the father and after it says in verse 26 after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he is dead but Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. So this is the point where I always just have to point out, imagine this piece of you're going up. Like if you were walking in Jesus stead as an ambassador of Christ, which we are ambassadors of Christ. Um, and as he is, so are we in this world. But if you were in this position and you were Jesus and you said, you know, I rebuked the enemy, leave. And then when you did that, he got worse, threw himself in the fire, convulsed, and then lay as if dead. Um, it, yeah, that most of the people thought dead, he is dead. Like even just those words, they're speaking that out. And it's like, you'd have to hold up your ears and go, I don't, I don't hear that because it'd be very hard to think, Oh, I, to not think I made it worse. I made it worse. So in the natural, in the carnal mind, in the natural mind, you're looking at the natural circumstances thinking, I thought I was going to rescue that kid through the power of the Holy Spirit in me. And I just made it worse. So maybe I should hightail it out of here. Just call 911 or something like he's dead now. And I thought he was setting it free. And it's just like, I mean, who knows what was going on in Jesus is mine, but he chose to focus on truth because he just, it says, but Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. So everybody, the majority of people are saying he's dead <laughs> and he's laying there as if dead. Yes, we don't really know if he is dead or if he just looked dead, but the carnal mind is definitely thinking he's dead, but Jesus doesn't even stop. He just takes him by the hand and raises him up and the boy gets up. So we don't stop. Faith doesn't stop. It stands, stands, and stands. Therefore, so that's that piece of like unbelief might come in alive from the enemy to focus on your carnal mind and you don't know what you're doing and run. And we just get to keep standing like Jesus did and say, no, I know this is done and taken by the hand. So um, it says, then when he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? They said, and he said, Jesus said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. So this one just says prayer. It cannot come out by anything but prayer. The other one says prayer and fasting in Matthew. And apparently in, yes, I have that there. In this version, the Mark version, in the King James, fasting was added, but it's like not in any other version. So um, it is an interesting piece in there. And I want to look kind of just both at prayer and fasting. So it doesn't seem fasting is supposed to be in there, but people will often say this kind of only comes out by prayer and fasting. So we have to fast for a certain number of days or something. Well, they didn't do that in the Bible, but since he said it, let's look at what the Bible says about fasting, because we know, like I said, it doesn't say, okay, Jesus went away to fast for three days. Um, so he didn't do that, but in Isaiah 58, in Isaiah 58, in, the, in verses 3 through 6, he's talking about how to not fast. <laughs> like, don't 
make it about you. Um, don't make a scene, don't have contention and strife between people. And yeah, and, and is a fast just a day for a man to humble himself, bowing their head like a reed? Like, no, it's, it's not. So it's not about us. It's not about how long you can fast. Did you do it? Are you earning something? We're not earning anything. The fast is to help us die to our flesh, die to our carnal nature and carnal desires that the body's calling for food and we are subduing it and, and living led by the spirit anyway. And so it would be to help you focus on the spiritual side, to tune, you know, be able to tune, practice tuning out the carnal. Um, and so the focus would be to tune into God, God's will, uh, the people that he would want set free and everything, right? And so really Jesus was doing that. He was focused on that boy and God's will. So maybe he was fasting. He wasn't eating in that very moment. That was mentioned in our group. He wasn't eating in that moment, right? And and he was thinking about God and God's will and not the carnal stuff because otherwise he would have given up when the boy died. So but if we look at Isaiah 58, starting at verse six, it talks about what fasting is. Is this not a fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free? So that's a fast, to let the oppressed go free. And that boy was oppressed. Then it says, and break every yoke. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry? So a fast would be to, you know, share your food with people that need it. And then it says, and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own flesh then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you the glory of the lord will be your rear guard then you will call and the lord will answer he will cry and he will say here i am if you remove the yoke from your midst the pointing of the finger and speaking of wickedness so we are and it, it goes, yeah, it goes on and on to say, if you do that, the Lord will continually guide you, satisfy your desire in scorched places, give you strength to your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Um, that was verse 11, though in verse 12, it says, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. So that is some good promises. It's like to fast is to set the captives free, set the oppressed free, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Um, and then all these blessings are coming, right? Again, it's not earning, but it's just the way God set up his world. It doesn't align with the world's way. And so fasting doesn't mean, okay, if I fast for three days, then the power will increase. The power is the same. The Holy Spirit is the same. We have the whole Holy Spirit. The power does not change. Granted, if you are doing that and it is really helping you focus on God and get your mind on the spiritual things and not the carnal things, and therefore helps you keep your eyes stayed on him, great. It's not that you don't do it. It's good. It's good to do it, but it's not good to put in a rule that you have to, or it won't work because then you might come across somebody who needs help and think, Oh, I didn't fast for three days. So I, you know, God, God can't help you. Like it's, that's not fair. So anyway, we get to go, you know, the fasting he was talking about not eating, he says his disciples were not doing and were not to do until he leaves. So the only other thing I can think of fasting, if it's even supposed to be in there, which it seems like most people agree it's not, it's not in most of my Bibles, but I just felt like, well, we can just assume it's in there and look into it. And there are ways to talk about this and say, yeah, we can fast and set the captives free. And then if we look at prayer, because this kind of doesn't go out by anything but prayer, 
so much of that word has become sit and beg and assume that God will not actually give you what you ask for. And yet it says, ask, and you see, you seek, find, like, you know, knock and the door shall be open to you. There's no, it might, if you do it right, or if you're a good girl or something, it's, it just says, do that. Ask and receive, seek, find, knock, open. So prayer isn't begging, it's standing and believing that what you ask for, you will receive you will receive. So if we look at a few different places, I have Matthew. Well, let's, no, let's look at Mark first. So Mark 11, go to Mark 11. Second, if you'd like to follow along. So Mark 11, 23 and 24. And it says, truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Okay, that goes into a whole other section, but we're going to just stick with verse 24 and 25 for what we're talking, or 23 and 24 for what we're talking about here, because all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you receive them and you will be granted them. So if you're praying, you're always thinking like, I don't know, but maybe, maybe that's not prayer. That's not what he's talking about. It's, it's at least not prayer in faith. It's not prayer with believing. And so prayer is fellowship and communion with God. I would say that makes sense that we need to do that just all the time. It's needed with everything. And then um, if we look at Matthew 21, Matthew chapter 21, we go to verse... start at verse 20. So it, Jesus has just, um, I think it was the same in Mark, that Jesus has just killed the fig tree or cursed the fig tree that um, didn't produce fruit. So seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? In verse 21, so Matthew 21, 21. And Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. So if you ask, believing in prayer, right? If you ask in prayer, if you're communicating with God and you are believing, you receive. You will receive. And then let's look at ask. When you look up that word, ask, people will say, well, I had to ask and you know if you're thinking of a earthly father maybe you just don't know where they land on anything and you, you can't figure out how you know when is a good time and when they might say yes and where they might say yes it's not consistent god's consistent he does not shift he, no no shifting of shadow ask when you look it up in the greek says ask the usage is to ask request petition and demand. Those are strong words. So we in our English language have changed ask to be more of a, maybe can you please versus I demand this. And it's, that can sound disrespectful. It's not because it's your, you are requesting or demanding how, you know, but you are just speaking what God has already said. You can have, you believe and you ask and it aligns with God's will gives us things that align with his will, right? And our, as we keep our eyes on him, our desires align with his our will aligns with his, he gives us those things. So yeah, we, and then, um, so just remembering that what, what ask really means. We're going to go to Matthew seven. This has come up so many times in the last six months, and it's just good to be going through it with you all, whoever might be watching this in the future. So Matthew seven, seven through nine, ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks find finds and to him who knocks it will be open 
And then if we go to verse nine, oh, what man is there among you who when he asks his son or when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will not give him a snake, will he? So, and that's, you know, then it says you like humans being evil, give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father who's in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So we get to ask and know what will be given. Seek and we will find. Knock and it will be open. So it's that belief part, the trusting. And, you know, we're not bargaining. We're not begging. We're not assuming the answer is no. We know the will of the Father. We know what the answer is. And we are just speaking it. And it is done. And we know things are already finished. And we don't even need to ask for most things. We're just commanding the enemy to leave. Like, um, Jesus says it is finished, it is done. So I think it's important to keep that in mind too. And yet we can still ask for wisdom. And it says that, you know, in our spirit, we have the wisdom and knowledge of the ages. And so if we look at the spirit that is completely healed, a spirit that has all the wisdom and knowledge of the ages, everything that it needs for life and godliness, well, then why would we ever ask for wisdom? But it says ask for wisdom. Well, if you know we have that in our spirit but are we asking it um our, our heart is what is like the, i see it as a conduit or connection between our spirit and our soul and then our soul affects our body so so between our spirit and our soul and our body is our heart and so if we're asking for wisdom we're asking for help from all the wisdom and knowledge of the ages that's in our spirit to be released into our heart. So our minds, our thoughts can take a hold of it. It can affect our, our soul and then our, our brain and our body as well. Because in James 1, let's go to James 1. It's one right after Hebrews. So James 1, verses 5 through 8, it says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So again, we're asking. We're, you know, the usage being that uh, ask, petition, request, demand. So, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And we know we've gone over this verse in lots of different uh, live settings and stuff. I don't know on this video how much, but receive, you look up that word. It's, you could look at this and think, so if I waver at all, God will hold back and not think I'm worthy and not give me anything. Not that we're worthy in our earning, but God has said that we are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. So he's deemed us worthwhile to give everything we need for life and godliness but it's not in our own earning worth but where it says for that man ought not to expect to receive anything from the Lord. sorry the word receive is aggressively accepting what is available and offered so it's up to us to take it god's already given it it and that's the aggressively accepting and receiving aggressively accepting and taking what is already available and offered if you're given a gift but you do not open it up, then you cannot receive anything from that person. They've given it to you, but you're not actually receiving the gift. It doesn't mean they haven't given it. So it doesn't mean God's going, I'm withholding because you had to leave it a doubt for a moment, because that's the other thing. You can doubt. You can have a doubt. You can have a lie come from the enemy. And you can just stand against it and go, no, no. Um, I'm not, I'm not receiving that. I'm not going to change my behavior. I'm going to keep walking forward. I'm going to keep standing. And, you know, so that's not really doubt. It's being tempted to doubt. If we do doubt though, and we totally change our behavior because we've doubted God, it doesn't mean we're permanently doubting. We can come back and stand and bring our eyes back to God and just start over. So, um, yeah, don't ever think that it's too late, right? It's okay to doubt. We are learning and growing in all of this, and we're learning our identity. And it was pointed out, like, the disciples, you know, 
maybe didn't really know their identity. And the truth is they were very new to this. They were just learning about this and they had the Holy Spirit upon them. They were still in the old covenant at this point. It's not Jesus hasn't died and been resurrected. The Holy Spirit hasn't come. They're not one with the Holy Spirit. They don't have the mind of Christ. I mean, they, they have it upon them so they can still function in all of it, but they still don't even know the mystery that it's the Holy Spirit in us, right? The hope Christ in us, the hope of glory from Colossians 127. They don't know that yet. They learn it all. They write the epistles and everything, but they don't have the new Testament to read and learn from about their identity. And so they're learning that they, you know, maybe went to their carnal mind and saw, and I mean, we can have all sorts of things, but that unbelief is just, we get to to learn from that. And now we do have, we do have so much. We have the new Testament that tells us all about our identity. We get to check into that. We know that the enemy wants to stand against our identity and confuse us on that, right? When the enemy came to Jesus in the desert, the first thing he said is, if you are the son of God, do X, Y, Z. If you are, if you are, that's an identity attack. So we get to just keep learning about our identity, keeping our eyes on him, choosing to stand and agree with God and what he says about our identity and not what the enemy says and keep those things separate and be in agreement with God and not with the enemy. And um, yeah, it's just, and it's amazing to think, you know, Jesus could have waited to have the disciples be given the Holy Spirit till after Pentecost, but he had them do it then. I mean, there could be a hundred different reasons, but he says, oh, I don't have that verse in front of me, but that, that it was because of compassion that he saw all these people, um, see if I can find it. Um, he saw all of these people hurting and needing help and there weren't enough um, harvesters for all the harvest. And so out of compassion, he sends out, oh yeah, Matthew 9, 35, starting at 35. And because Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then Saith he, so he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly really is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So he was moved with compassion to appoint the, um, the disciples. So it, it says in verse 38, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And 10.1 says, and when he had called unto his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean, spir unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So the very compassionate God. Thank you, God. And so I just hope this was helpful. It was helpful to me to go through it all and even again and, you know, done it before. And it was just, it's just good to share it all. And so I just... Hope this helps. Share it with anybody you think it might help. Uh, like, subscribe, comment, let me know your thoughts, uh, what does help and everything. And I just hope you guys have an awesome day. You can join us for little mini scripture mind renewal sessions and praise and worship sessions. And uh, we take the chunks of scripture that we read in those sessions and read them again the next day and just read them through and praise God through them and just help renew our mind to our identity, God and God's identity and his word. So anyway, it's awesome and fun. And then we do just relaxing things to support our body. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we want to just help and support it and align with God's will for us to be well. So I have laughter sessions and somatic. Soma is the word for the body. So um, it's just a time to really be present in your body and take care of it and give it some attention to help it just rest and recuperate and recover. And then self-lymphatic massage to just support our amazing immune system and autonomic nervous system. And it's just, it's, yeah, a great time of just taking care of 
the amazing person God made. So I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.